DC 101, it's Mike Jones. Today I'm talking with Rafael Colantonio, the co-creative director of the video game Dishonored. One of my favorite games that I've played in a very long time. Raf, how great was it for you guys to sit around and come up with such a unique concept like Dishonored? Right, that's, uh, you know, if, if it's your thing, then it's the, it's the best job in the world. Because, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's... Not necessarily easy because it takes time and there's a lot of things that don't work at first, uh, you know, on the first uh, time you do it. But it's, uh, it's definitely fun. And how did you guys figure out exactly which weapons to use? Because it's not like you're just picking up a gun, going through and blowing everything away. You know, you're using grenades and uh, the the spring razor or or magical powers. I mean, just to get that right combination had to take you guys forever. Yeah, it took a while. I mean, the, all that was mostly defined during a uh, pre-production phase. We, you know, we applied the filters of uh, it needs to be around the theme of the assassin. Uh, it needs to be there needs to be no redundancy in the in the weapons. We we don't want to you know we don't want a knife and a, and a sword and uh, and a short knife. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we want e- we want every weapon to be distinctive from each other, uh, and so that way it, it takes time. And uh, and also, really, in terms of weapons themselves, we didn't want to have a crazy full arsenal because we wanted to complement the the combat and the weapons with the usage of, uh, of powers. And, and the powers is actually the inter- interesting ingredient here that changes the context of the of the of the fight suddenly. You know, you slow down time, and so mm-hmm. now it, it takes another 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 uh, level. You know, or you blink around. Uh, so that was the thinking. Like we wanted like four, five signature weapons, and then the powers. And also the fact that with the powers that you're discussing, you know, you don't have to get all of them. You can get only one or two and finish the game, and you can have a whole new gaming experience when you play it through the next time and get totally different powers and try to finish the game that way too. That was awesome. Yeah, we try to think of our our missions in general and even the the challenges in general, we, we try to think them in terms of like there's an objective that needs to be reached and uh, we don't really care how you do it. So we give you all the tools and then, you know, find your own play style. All those tools are very, um, they have a lot of dimensions in their, in their design and, and they can interact with each other in interesting ways. And this is going to lead to some... Uh, it, Logical situations, but also like situations that were not planned and that is going to surprise the players and even us, the designers. And uh, that's what we like. You know, we, we love that, uh, how far the, the unplanned simulation can, uh, can actually uh, take the players. Have you guys had people that are like beta testing the game for you, regular players, and maybe they find something that you've never even thought of and you're like, oh my God, look, you can do that by doing this. We didn't even know that. Yeah, all the time, and even even today, you know, when uh, when now those YouTube videos and uh, we, we will see something that we've never seen before. The latest, I think, was uh, uh, we saw a guy um, throwing a grenade, freezing time, and then switching to the wind blast, and then he could like actually wind blast the grenade, which is impossible if you don't use bend time because other, you know you don't have time to switch. But he could actually, and so the grenade went to the other side, you know, to all the way to the, the other side of the level, and uh, that was a very interesting uh, <laughs> strategy. These guys, I watched a bunch of those uh, the YouTube clips. It seems like there's a competition now. Who can have the coolest kill or like the furthest assassination from way up high? And it's a fun thing that's going on with YouTube. It's like kind of an underground part of the game now. It is, and uh, I think these same guys are going to be very happy with uh, with the first DLC um, that you know, the Dunwall City Trials that we actually are uh, shipping soon. Because you know, a hint that I can give you is that there is something related to that. The oh, high, high, yeah, high, uh, okay. Now I was reading about uh, a couple rumors about the first part. Now there are going to be a couple downloadable levels coming out soon. It's the it's the story of Dowd. Dowd is the assassin mm-hmm. that, uh, at the beginning of the game, killed the Empress, and uh, he's, he's a he's an interesting character. And we thought it would be players might have a lot of uh, uh, you know interest in, in learning more about him.
Very nice. I can't wait to hear uh, hear more about it and actually play it when it does come out. Now, Raf, what uh, what was the influence for making Dishonored? Like, did you guys just come up with this story sitting around, or did it come from tales from the industrial era, or how did you guys put this all together? No, I could tell you that uh, we are geniuses and we came up with it in, in one afternoon, but it's not the case. We uh, we the reality is that it's a very very long and inter- iterative process where um, initially, I mean, to, to be very clear, at the very, very beginning, all we knew was that it would be a game with, uh, around the theme of the assassin with some level of supernatural in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we talked even about ninjas at first. And uh, so we really, you know, the only, the only true thing that we were sure about was, that, was the game values, the values that we always fall back on, which are, uh, you know, first person, uh, depth, some level of RPG-ness, uh, choices matter, player play style, all these things. Those, those, are, those are things that we've always been in love with, you know, that uh, the same of uh, that they were in the in the looking glass kind of game. Like, uh, uh, even Bioshock is to some degree is like that too. And so uh, that were the only things we knew we, uh, of, the, of the game. And then after that, we started with a few ideas of, of setting, and uh, one of them, which was exciting to uh, a good uh, portion of the leads, was to uh, uh, London in 1666. And we wanted to make it very historical, like very real, very grounded, dirty, the plague, uh, very intimate kills. And uh, that was cool. You know, we, we worked on that for a while, come up with a story. Like, we were inspired by the real uh, history of the world, mm-hmm. and, uh, the names of people back then, etc., and uh, after a while, we were just like, as we were designing those, those uh, missions, we were like, okay, now it's time to integrate some more gadgets, some more security devices, and also, to be honest, like to justify the magic, because we had this component of magic, which was very subtle. It was all about, uh, you know, maybe if you focus for long enough, you can actually douse a, a, a flame from a distance, you know, this kind of thing. And it was not over the top enough, obviously. So we actually... Uh, Added a true layer of magic, something that was that came with the outsider, uh, this character in, in Dishonored, which uh, is uh, God and the and the devil wrapped into one. Uh, and so we added him. We added all the mythology about him and, and uh, who are his enemies, who uh, what is what what the people believe in this world. Like, do they what happens if they die? What's what's the concept of of uh, heaven and hell in the in this world, which is not heaven and hell actually. Uh, so and, and then once we had that, we added another layer, which was the technology. The, the back then we used to call it the retro futuristic layer, uh, and and later on people started to call it steampunk, mm-hmm. but it never came from us. That's the interesting thing. Uh, back then we were like, okay, so we probably need gun, and we probably need some level, some sort of guns, and uh, we need some gadgetry, we need some energy, and so we pushed. We said, okay, what if there was an alternate? Industrial Revolution, not the one that we know, uh, not the one with Tesla and all that, but like something else, and um, and so we that, that that's where we came up with the with the whales and the and the and the oil that was processed and turned into uh, some energy that could be used uh, in different ways, and uh, and then as as everything came together, it it became its own thing, and uh, we we pushed it forward in time. It was not in in 1666 anymore. In fact, it even even mattered and when it was we like it was approximately two or three hundred later, uh, two or three hundred years later, and it was not even London anymore. It was just it became you know Dunwall and and everything became our own world. And we and from there, the the the, the world would become more and more special and more and more our own world. So that's why I was saying it. It really did not came up in an afternoon. It was like <laughs> <laughs> you're talking about six six months to a year of iteration and, and adding layers and it's it's an organic process, but it's still a process, you know. It's not that we didn't know where we were going, it's that it has to gestate. It has to you know, it, it needs time to, to become what it was. Mm-hmm. Um you guys if if you don't know you had such a great cast for doing the voices on there, like Susan Sarandon's in there, um John Slatterty, he's Roger Sterling from Mad Men, Michael Madsen uh, Carrie Fisher, how'd you guys get those people to do the voices? Because I'm sure that's not just, oh, hey, what are you doing this afternoon? Can you do this for us? Because that's, you know, that's a huge part of the game with all the people talking to you and the interaction, too. 
Yeah, and uh, you know that's one of the many benefits of working with a uh, with a group like uh, uh, Bethesda, Zenimax, who you know they have uh, some nice experience and connections with uh, with this world of the of the movies. Uh, from the process standpoint, it was Harvey and I mostly uh, looking at all the characters, the key characters of the of Dishonored, and uh, coming up with a list of for each of those characters, the people that we think would actually uh, do a good job mm-hmm. at, at at being those characters, and it was, you know, the 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 the, the sky was the limit. I mean, we we could just like we could come up with anybody. There was no, we, we just like listed every actor that we thought was uh, would do the job, right? Uh, and uh, once we had a list of like four or five per. For a character, we give them to uh, to a company that we work with, who actually uh, is in contact with all those those actors. And their job at those at this point was to try to contact them. If they were not available, see if they if there was another actor that actually, based on the list we gave, uh, would also fit. Like so, some, sometimes, for example, they would see that we named this and this and this actor. But because of the knowledge of the industry, they, they they could think of another actor that is actually kind of similar in his tone and in his uh, in his uh, acting uh, qualities. Mm-hmm. And so they came back to us with a list. Uh, it was a mixed list, both of the of the ones that were actually available and agreed to do that, and some suggestions of theirs that would, would do the job. So uh, it, it it worked it worked really well. And we, were, we were super happy. And some of them, you know, we wanted from the beginning, and and we had them. And uh, some of them were suggestions, and, and it was great suggestions. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll do that again anytime. Well, you should be happy with it. I mean, all the speech and the interaction with people, it helps make the game even better than it already is. Raf, what level of all of them inside of Dishonored, what's the one that you're most proud of that you say, hey, this really made the game for me? As a designer, I love this part. Uh, I think... Well, Harvey might have a different answer than I would, uh, but like I think both of us actually really like the Lady Boyle uh, and uh, Return to the Tower as well. Mm-hmm. Personally, I like Return to the Tower because it's probably one of the most canonical level in terms of like infiltrate, uh, highly guarded security uh, fortress, and then kill an important person and then escape. Right? It, it has this full pattern, this full loop of infiltration, uh, identifying, finding, and then killing, and and then the escape as well, which is another it's an entire uh, phase on its own. Because you can go through that one and either kill or not kill, and but you come out with the same result in the end either way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, it's a very it's a very complex scripted mission. It, it it allows players to really really finish it in many different ways, and that's that's really what I like about it. The canonical aspect and the and the multiple ways to do things. And then I think I really like the the Lady Boyle because it's uh, uh, it's it's its own thing. You know, it breaks entirely the pattern. Uh, suddenly, like there is this mission where we we surprise the player in a way where like oh actually, in this mission nobody is hostile to you, and uh, now you're gonna have to mingle around and start talking to people. Um, and then even like identify who is the target because by the way she's wearing a mask and so like the game takes an entire d- different pace I think you know it's its own thing uh, and 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 of of course there's still the the lethal way to just like kill everybody and and uh, and everything goes into mayhem but or just play the game uh, in a, in a non lethal way and, and start talking to everybody so I think this one is a very interesting mission it, it was like it was. A, you know, beautiful to to look at evolve to to watch it evolve and and to see all the ways the players would uh, uh, would try to to achieve their goals in there. I would have to say for me, uh, the golden cat was my favorite part of the whole game because there's so many ways you can finish that mission and you know either helping out um, to put the guys in the mine or you can just take them out whichever way you feel. I, I just thought there was so much thought in that and there's so many ways to get in there and infiltrate. Just such a quality mission in the entire game. Yeah, you know, I would have to agree. The Golden Cat was an awesome level, and uh, I probably did not mention it because that's the one that I've, I've seen it so much. It's the one that we used for the E3 demo and mm-hmm. then, like, some other some other uh, events. Uh, that it became, I you know, I saw it over and over and over. But I agree. Like, uh, if I if I step back, it's also a very good one, obviously.
And um, it might be the second to last mission where you end up, uh, you go down through the sewers and you're helping Slackjaw, or you can help Granny Rags. I just thought that was a nice side mission, too. Another thing that people might not know about, but if you find it, it's a really cool thing to discover and help you along to the end of the game. Yeah, and I'm great we kept those. Uh, you know, those, those like this, this aside thing about Granny uh, and uh, the full threat, actually, from the threat from the beginning of the game until the end, is something that really got killed almost a few times, uh, just because it's a diversion, it's a distraction from the from the main drama. Uh, but I'm so glad we managed to keep it in because it's uh, it's also very very special and it's like it's optional. So people that do it feel more invested in it for some reason. And and this little story with Granny and and the resolution at the end is really interesting. And I I actually wish we had a little more of those. Uh, and I'm glad we kept them in. Well, maybe in uh, Dishonored 2, whenever that's going to come out, you could do a little more like that. Yeah, or, or you know, or something else, or maybe in the DLC. It's, mm-hmm. it's like, it's definitely, you know, a first, uh, the, the, the one you, when you do a new game, like it, it, was the, it was a new IP, so you, you mostly know where you're going, but there's always like a little bit of unknown in there, and, uh, and that was one of these elements where, uh, you know, is it a good idea? Is it a bad idea? And uh, you know, thankfully, we we kept this uh, this this little thing in there. And I think they they do add to the depth of the world and and uh, the, for this this style of game. It was a risk because you know, for a while we just thought like maybe people won't like that. Maybe maybe it's a distraction from the main objective and people forget about the main story. Um, but yeah, as you said, I think uh, it, it's a good lesson and it's a, it was a good proof that. You know, we might want to use this other kind, of, this same kind of thing for future games. Well, Raph, thank you very much for taking some time today, and thank you guys for putting out really one of the best video games that I've played in forever. If you guys don't get considered, nominated, or given Game of the Year by all kinds of different magazines and online. Pop-